Hey everybody, welcome back to the Mark Loeffler Experience. We've got two of my great friends, Jeff and Clint from Omaha, Nebraska with us today. They're gonna to go through real estate investing. They're gonna go through business building. Guys, this is gonna be jam packed, 20, 25 minutes of your time. So thanks for joining us. If you haven't and you love this channel, go back down, like and subscribe, smash that like button for the YouTube al algorithm. Guys, Jeff, Clint, welcome. Mark, so happy to be here. Thanks, buddy, for having us on. Thanks for having us on. Looking forward to it. My pleasure. My pleasure. And you guys run a, um, and well, Jeff, you, you run a team building podcast for, for real estate agents, correct? Team leaders, broker owners that want to scale their business and stop selling real estate and focus on building a profitable business. Good, good. All right. I mean, that's not why I brought you on. I know you're one of the top uh, real estate agents in US, Canada, North America, whatever. That's fine. Who gives a crap, right? Um, this is more about, I, I know you guys are great investors, right? And, and business builders and systems and model builders, right? So this is why I want you guys on here to talk about that. So Clint, you're the star of the show, buddy. Tell, tell us, oh, tell us your- I'm so excited. Your... <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about our, our journey, Mark, uh, just where we started. I spent most of my career in corporate America, uh, working for Frito-Lay, working for ConAgra, both food companies, working in food manufacturing on manufacturing systems and lean processes. All hey, the while, Clint, 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 stop boring. Already? Already? Okay, I'm moving on. All the while I was watching Jeff, my best friend, lifelong best friend, grew up together. Uh, he started doing really well in real estate and building a team. Uh, in 2014, we had started collaborating, talking about what it would be like to own rentals together, flip houses together. He had a lot of resources and knowledge in the market. I had a lot of drive and interest in flipping and real estate investing. So we uh, did a couple of experimental flips in 2014. Um, he was, so, he stayed you, so, you, so you guys have been doing this six years now? Going on six um, years. Yeah. I've done about four or five deals when I was like 23 through 27 just as I would come across some in my residential real estate sales journey, but nothing at scale. Yeah, it, it was very part-time, Mark. We did three deals in 2014. We did another five flips in 2015. And then 2016, I quit my day job. So everything was on the side. I quit my day job and Jeff and I uh, went full, on, full out and we started marketing for deals. So those first eight deals that we did in those first two years were just kind of stuff that fell in our lap. They were short sales. It was stuff that was on the MLS or we found on Craigslist. 2016, when I quit my job and we really wanted to ramp up and scale and buy more houses, we realized that we're going to have to start marketing directly to motivated sellers. So we started educating mastermind groups, listening to podcasts like hey, this. Can you repeat that? You guys cut out there. Okay. Uh, I, I said that we started listening to, we started joining mastermind groups. We listened to podcasts. We started educating ourselves so that we knew how to market to motivated sellers. That became a very critical piece. So just so you know, that Jeff and I met in 2015. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that. Just coincidence, maybe. Are you trying to take credit for something? So to take all the credit away from Mark, what I will share with your audience is in 2011, I applied all the strategies Clint just spoke of in my residential real estate business. And we grew from 70 to over 700 sales in six years to today it's the fastest growing residential real estate team in history and we left Berkshire Hathaway last year as the number one team in the world at Berkshire and why it does matter that I ran and run a successful real estate business is that any successful real estate business can also be an investment company and any successful investment company should be a successful real estate business just like Mark runs in Canada you've got both arms and I think that so often we think it only can be one or the other when in fact it should be both 100 percent agree all right, so let's go back. Uh, 2015, yep. 2016, so you guys start ramping up marketing. Mid 2016, I went full time. We started ramping up marketing. I made this um, everything that I did, quit my full time job, and we started uh, paying for marketing. First thing we started doing was telemarketing, outbound calling, cold calling. We used virtual assistants. Jeff actually has ownership in the company um, that we were using the virtual assistants to make outbound dials to motivated sellers. We have hundreds of callers that make thousands of calls a day for. A bunch of investors all over North America. Then we layered in uh, direct mail, which is still our our lead uh, source um, for for generating deals. Um, that's our number one source. We started layering in PPC. That's like ten thousand mailers a month that we send out. All right. Yeah. So talk to me about talk to me about that just briefly. What what, what yeah, does a just, mailer look like? A mailer is a, a little yellow postcard or a little. We have a few different variations. A little three by five postcard. Is that, that Ron LeGrand says, style. 
Yeah, there, there's a few different variations. We have some that say urgent notice or some that say third notice, some that say 1031 exchange on it. And we're, we're primarily shooting those to people who should be motivated to sell, meaning they have high equity in their property. They own it outright. Uh, the most elite, the, what I consider the most motivated seller is an absentee owner. Anybody who owns a home that does not live in that home is typically the most motivated, whether they inherited it, whether it's a, a rental property, just a vacant property that they moved out of, or for some reason they can't sell. Um, so we market heavily to absentee owners, cool. um, worse, distress, people who are behind on their mortgage. We um, do mailers, bandit signs, voicemail drops, door knocking. Um, we also empower all of our agents within my residential company. I have 40 agents in Omaha, Nebraska mm -hmm. to do the iBuyer program. So on every traditional listing presentation, they can offer 30% below market closing in seven days based on their market analysis. So these are all the different ways that we've focused our attention in finding our budgets, probably what 15 grand a month right yeah. now. And what's interesting looking at a parallel of my residential business in the last 10 years, we've spent a million dollars on lead gen in the res on the residential side, which generated us about a hundred thousand leads. And it's really no different from a lead conversion standpoint. The processes are very similar in acquiring deals. Um, a lot of times people get burned out and they say there's no deals, right? Montreal's all picked apart. Chicago, you can't buy homes. And in, in Omaha, you can't buy homes. Well, you turn over enough rocks, you'll find homes. And so well, we need it, to generate how many appointments, Clint, break down all of our numbers. It's pretty crazy how many calls we have to make to get a lead. I think it's 22,000 calls from a cold caller making 1,000 calls a day on a three-line dialer gets us one acquisition a month. And that usually will cost us anywhere between two and $3,000 yep. to pay toward a quality caller. But two or three grand to make our average um, property with a wholesale, wholesale or flip is going to net us about twenty two thousand five hundred. So it's a ten x return on the callers. Well, and it's the same game on the mailers and a lot of the other strategies. Yep. Well, it's funny. I mean, I know you guys have watched the every every um, every uh, video that I've had on the channel so far, and you'll you'll it's notice. Yeah, you've done content. such an awesome job. Great content. You brought uh, some really amazing uh, powerhouse guests. So yeah, stop, that. it's awesome. Stop work. bullshitting a bullshitter, okay? Um, but uh, Man Mandy and Larry Branham, I had them on last week, two yeah. weeks ago. I don't remember, two weeks ago. Um, and they were talking about, I mean, they have no trouble. Like their, their deal pipeline is fine, and they're bringing in money partners, and they're, they're saying the exact same thing, right? It's like, for you guys to go get a deal, you're talking to a, a, a bit, a, like a crap load of people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and you're funneling it down, and that's how they Listen, find it. It's no out. different than for anyone in residential where – to get a listing lead, people say, oh, you get all these listings, what do you do? Oh, I work. And the well, funny thing is grandpa always said, the harder you work, the luckier you get. The same thing applies to finding deals. And it doesn't matter if you're single family, commercial, multifamily, if you're wanting to do syndications, the deals are out there. You just have to be willing to talk to people. Well, and, and here's the thing, right? It's like anything, any sales, this is basically a sales thing. It's a contact sport, right? right. The more contacts you make, the more contracts you make. Yeah, more right. So we track everything and we've always been yeah. really analytical. Um, we had been using Podio. We're using a new product now, but CRMs are huge so that you at the end of the year know where did each and every dollar go and then what efforts were had behind that dollar. So how many calls were made, how many contacts were made based on those calls, how many appointments were realized, how many appointments do you need to realize to get one executed contract? And then you can start delineating literally using a heat map what your avatar looks like. So we, used to, we would track every year, where did the majority of our deals come from and where were our net uh, proceeds based on like different regions of Omaha? Where were we seeing the greatest returns? And then we would put more energy, more time, more marketing into the areas that got us the greatest return in the least amount of time with the least amount of energy. Yeah, let, right. me talk so, about, let me talk about some of our discoveries too that we made. So 2016, we did uh, about another 12, 12 deals total and we started buying rentals. Um, and Jeff and I got in this business not to to have a job. It was really to have passive income to become. By the way, I'm just going to share with you. That's where I credit myself coming into Jeff's life. And uh, you know, we talked to you long before. This is a 2012 conversation. Mark does all credit for something. I'm sorry, like we I just want, come on. Can I just give myself a pat on the back here? Come something. on. Good job. You know what? Mark idiot. taught me about syndications. Okay. Yeah. I learned a lot about syndication. I haven't done one yet. Okay. I've been a part of a few. Yeah. So um, come 2017, 2018, 2019, we did um, 40 deals, 2017, another 60 to 80 in 2018, 2019, we did another 80 deals. And what do you oh, mean so, by so, doing deals is we acquired those properties? We bought houses. Yeah. We kept a third while you drink and choke out. Um, all of those deals he referenced were acquisitions. And we, 
in the beginning started keeping about half as holds until we realized how much we'd have to pay in taxes. And so then we realized that the formula wasn't keeping half of them as long-term holds. Um, it was about a third. So we were able to buy three, keep one, and then flip the other two. And when I say flip, we learned quickly that putting 30 to 50,000 wasn't necessary in a seller's market. We could just go put a thousand dollars in and wholetail it where we closed on it and then sold it retail. And we'd be able to make around $22,000 when we wholesaled it to another investor or owner occupant, we'd only make about 10 grand. And when we flipped it, we'd make like 25 grand. So to us taking on all that risk of a flip and pouring in all your money for a few that not, you know, won't sell, it's not worth the risk. And we started wholetailing. That's still what we're doing today. We think that's a better strategy right now with where the market's at than flipping. You wholesale them onto the market just on, right? We buy, it, we buy it. We usually mow the lawn, clean out all the stuff in the house and list on the market immediately. And that's, that was a big discovery for us. We thought in the beginning that we needed to fix up the house and we need to look right. And the, the big discovery is, is that you, you make the money when you buy it. It's so like, everyone out there, people, people are in two camps. One's the wholesale camp because they can't close because they have no money. And then the other camp is the flipper camp who has tons of money and they're borrowing it from all these people. And they're pouring it into these properties. It doesn't have to be either of those scenarios. How about you close on it and you fix it up, put a thousand bucks and you put it on the MLS. It's a seller's market in most places or a stronger neutral market. And you can make margin, almost the same margin. And so we've had a lot of success doing that. But again, we're plugging into my real estate team. So we're not having to pay a ton of money on the listing side. We're only paying a thousand dollars to our disposition manager who's listing it. And then on the acquisition side, we're paying them $2,000 to go on all these appointments, but we're a volume business. So if we do a hundred deals this year, which is our goal to our acquisition managers and disposition managers are hitting their numbers. Yeah. Good. All right. So guys, walk me through a deal. Walk me through a buy and hold. A buy and hold deal. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, you guys tell me about the wholesale. It cost yeah. you 3000 to get it. You're making 22, you're net 19. Okay. Easy. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I can tell you about a deal that we're closing on tomorrow. Um, oh, perfect. We're, we're, like paying, those. Fresh. we're paying, we're paying $82,500 for a house. Okay. Um, what is it? Three bedroom, two bath, four bedroom, three bedroom, three? one bath. It's a three bedroom, one bath on kind of a busy street, but in a great, a great part of town in midtown for us is a great little area. There's an existing renter in the property, a tenant who's paying 900 a month, which is about 150 to $250 uh, below rents where it should be. So it should be renting for 1100 or 1200 uh, possibly, especially if we made some improvements to the property, but it hasn't hey, existed. Hold on. I have to, I have to ask, is that true local bacon? This is Omaha bacon. Oh, you need to get, you got, you got to order some true local bacon from Mark LaFleur. I'd love him to send me some. Right. There you go, Mark LaFleur. Anyway, back to the rental. Uh, <laughs> We are paying 82.5 for it. Uh, it. It rents at 900, should be 1100, 1200. And we are, we, we actually sent this guy a mail piece and he is an absentee owner. He lives out of state, wanted to sell the house. It's worth about 120, the house is. Now here's where it means a lot more to us. What we've been doing the last couple of years is using leveraging the Burr method. Mark, if you're familiar, buy. Well, we I mean, have, if you guys have been watching my videos, you know that okay. would be one of my first videos that okay. I ever did we on love this Burr. channel. That is what we do. I appreciate the support and the love. Yes. So <laughs> we love the Burr method. If we don't have to talk about it, you already know what it is. Um, His listeners might not. Why don't you share with everybody? Yeah, share what it is. It's okay. So you buy the house, that's the B, and then you rehab it you rent it, refinance it, and repeat. So we have leveraged that model to the nines for the last two years. And we have some great banking partnerships that will uh, essentially help us do that. There's no seasoning period. The origination costs are really low. So we're able to buy on a line of credit that we have with a local bank. So I'm, I'm just gonna stop you right there. For one second. Yep. So seasoning period is means you don't have to hold that property for a period of time before you can refinance. I mean, most people have to months. wait. We refi at closing. So here's the thing. We heard Jeff Borum talk about that on uh, one of our earlier interviews as well. So guys, if you guys are in the States and you're doing this, make sure you go down to your local bank and, and you get this done because it, it, people are doing it. You have to interview 20 banks. A lot of people are so lazy. They go to the path of least resistance. We have a presentation, Clint. All the numbers Clinton's referenced today are actual numbers, not just numbers we're pulling out of a hat. And it's from our banking presentation. So we have a presentation when bankers come into my office, my 10,000 square foot office, we bring them into my, one of my six conference rooms and we walk them through our process for all of our business. Everything we're talking about today, we have PowerPoints for all of this and get to show them that we're running a viable flipping business. Typically when they hear them in flippers, 
they hear of a lot of people that ended up upside down because they're not using their own money. So once we're able to show that, we use the presentation, we get to actually pick and choose which banks we want to partner with. We have three banks we use today that are awesome. They only require in most instances 15% down, whereas typically you'll see 25% down. And then the crazy thing is if we can find a property that appraises for more than 15% below market, they'll write us a check for the difference. This is that refi. And part. I can talk about that in this example. Okay, let's do it. So we paid 82.5 for it. It's worth 120. We'll have our bank come in and do an appraisal. They'll appraise at 120 and they give us 80% of that 120, which is 96 grand. And there's no seasoning period in there. It's only about $700 for us to originate that loan. So we pull it off our line of credit and put it on a, a 20 year note. And those are usually like three to five year arms adjustable. And uh, we rock and roll. We pull all the cash out and then usually a little surplus, um, five to 10 grand, which we put right back into our, our, rental business, either our rental business or our flipping business, depending on whatever activity we're focused on. So we retain that cash. We don't go buy Ferraris with it. We, we retain the yeah. cash. Not yet. Wait, wait, and, Jeff, you don't have your Ferrari? What? Not yet. I'm going to get one though. Mark and I, uh, first time I was ever in our Ferrari, I think Mark was there with really? me, right? At iCar in Montreal. Yep. That was fun. Yeah. So that was our big discovery. And the nice part about having that positive cash gain is for us is you don't pay taxes because you're just changing equity for, for cash. Yeah. Um, so you take a gain on the property, you don't pay tax on it. If we were to flip that house and make 20 grand, uh, you know, we lose 20 to 30% uh, pretty quick so this, just paying taxes on it. I would say out of anything we've said so far and out of all of the experience we've had in this business in the last five years, this is the most valuable piece for anyone listening. And it's, all, it's like this pretend thing, it's a fantasy to most people, they talk about it, but they've never experienced it. Once you've done it, it, it is unreal. Like, and Mark, I know you've experienced this a lot, especially on bigger, bigger ventures. But what we're saying is we're closing on a property that we're buying and the bank is writing us a check at closing. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Like we're not spending money. We're getting money They're from the bank. Giving us money and a house. So, and, so we're also taking on a note that we have to pay on. So the biggest thing with, re, with the Burr strategy is you can't be – you can't take so much that now you're not covering your debt obligation. And we want to be in a position where if rates were to, you know, if uh, the market was to drop five or 10%, which is the greatest we ever see in the Midwest, we're pretty insulated. And so if rates were to drop, or sorry, not rates, the uh, value of properties drop 10%, we're still going to be able to cover our monthly expense. And we tried to keep our cash flow around $300 a month. Yeah. So, so how many, we try to how many properties a, a, are you holding right now? We are pushing about 80, the majority of those being single family homes. We do have a few um, small multifamilies. We have an 11 unit, uh, a six unit, a seven unit, a duplex, and then the remainder are single family homes. And we're fully leveraged. So we've got about a $10 million portfolio uh, that we owe about 7.5 7 million on. Fair enough. So the burst strategy is everything. Jeff said it. I mean, we once we discovered that and built the relationships with the local banks to be able to do that, if a house um, does not require a huge rehab and it's in, a, in a, our ideal rental location, we keep it. Yep. So, we, okay. It's crazy because if you're listening, you guys, you can flip a house and make 20 grand. You can wholesale, sorry, wholesale a house and make 10, wholesale a house and make 15, or hold the house and make 20 grand. So would you rather keep everything you're buying and make the same margin? And this, this is another big takeaway. You're not paying tax on the refi. When they write you that check for 20, that's not taxable. So uh, let's just go through the numbers real quick. So you bought an 825, you probably got $2,500 in closing costs. Is that fair? Uh, no, 1500 oh, 1500 Okay, so we're in for $84,000. We're getting a, a, um, a loan for 96000 right? You're renting for 900 So your mortgage on that on a 20-year um, note is probably around six hundred, six hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, probably about what, hundred dollars for insurance and property tax. I don't know what your guys. Uh, taxes are a little higher, but yeah, hundred dollars for property insurance, and then probably another, I mean, three grand a year divided by twelve for. So two fifty. Two fifty. So you're basically break even on this property because you're yeah. below market. But the rents need to be increased, right? Yeah. So question on that then. I mean, here's the thing now. How many people out there would go buy a break-even property that they that you got twelve grand in your pocket, and you had future rent increases? So I would. Yeah. Well, you guys just did. I, I mean, I would all day long. Yep. So I mean, my question to you guys then is, 
number one is I don't know the rules out, out there in Nebraska. Can you just like when the lease is up, can you raise the rent? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's no we, rent control. We have to honor the existing lease, obviously. Of course. It's a contract. Months, in a lot of cases, they're month to month anyway, by the time we buy it. Our and lease agreements are usually a 12 month and then it's month to month after that. So, so we, we do this. Here's the thing in Ontario, we do the same thing. And yet after I can only raise by the provincial guidelines. So the state guidelines, which is like 2% or something silly like that. Yet. I mean, that's again, no, that's why I'm looking down in the States now. Like that's because yeah. I mean, I, I guys, I, there's so much opportunity there. Like everybody I talk to that's buying and selling pro or doing properties in the States. Right. Like Mark, let me throw, let me throw something else out for your listeners that they could be thinking about. So in 2014, I stopped selling real estate and focused on building a business. And with that, no longer servicing and running a team, which we were Omaha's Elite Real Estate Group at that time, I was able to start ancillary businesses. So I launched an insurance company, a title company, a mortgage company, a coaching company, an investment business with Clint, and uh, I just recently launched a digital marketing company. Well, every business I just mentioned, except for the mortgage company, Dynamic Properties uses when we acquire and disposition homes. So we're using KW Elite to acquire and disposition. We're using insurance to insure all of our holds and our flips and our wholetails. Um, we're using a thousand calls a day for um, acquiring, okay. the finding the properties. Tell Clint to stop texting, okay? I'm looking, I'm looking at my business stuff here. <laughs> we're getting ready to drop a couple more bombs. Melton so, Bay okay, Jeff. Mark. So, so I mean, this is why you're here. Because, I mean, you, you're a master of, of partnering with people to grow businesses. I mean, Clint's a great example. Yeah. Right, like you bring your business building and marketing expertise, and he brings the operation side, correct? Exactly, yeah, rocket so, fuel. So, so talk to our listeners because this is a perfect joint venture, yeah. Well, Clint and I, Clint's a unique um case in that Clint grew up in the construction world. Um, a lot of his brothers own construction companies. His one of his brothers is actually our general contractor who has a contractor, uh, a degree in what, general contracting, yeah. And uh, Clint was around it. And then Clint also is an operator. So he worked at Frito-Lay and Ranch Cucamonga. And then he worked at Conagra Foods. And he was like on the line overseeing 150 employees. And so he loved processes. And so making he was making over six figures in Omaha. Great benefits. You know, had everything anyone would ever dream of as far as an eight to five is concerned. And he didn't have the ability, though, to make exponential income. He was kind of, you know, he had a kind of a limit. Hey, Jippers. How are you, bud? The dog was really excited that Clint is visiting my house. So <laughs> with that, and to your point, Mark, um, I kind of took Gary Keller's recommendation. Gary, if you guys don't know, owns the largest residential real estate company in North America with 180,000 agents. Gary said that all of our time should be spent finding talent. And so what I started doing is every person I met, I'd ask myself, how can I give create value for this person? What type of business could I partner with this person in? And what business that I own does this person need to start using and those were always my things that would roll through my mind well with clint we knew we wanted to partner together that was always like our childhood dream but there never really seemed like there was a huge opportunity that showed itself well clint moved to omaha and right away we were like hey we should start flipping and that's where we started doing it like part-time and i think we had seven or eight pendings part-time <clears throat> like over a hundred thousand of income coming in off part-time acquisitions and i was like i think it's time dude and he's like i agree i think it's time and it's just been amazing ever since all right, now, now the dog's distracting us. You got to show us the dog. Come here, Chip. Come here. You might get scared if I pick him up. He's kind of big. Come here, bud. Come say hi. He's a golden doodle. Say hi. <laughs> say hi. You're on our Chip. show. Chippers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got to go home now. Go upstairs. Go upstairs. All right. I mean, guys, like the uh, just some just some quick tips, and maybe this is these are some things that have been shared with you guys. Our average purchase price um, is 65% of ARV. So we so make after sure repair value. After repair value, what we would also call market value or median home sales for, you know, if we look at comparable sales, our ARV is the median home sale for a quarter mile of that same style property. We do a quarter mile perimeter. So we make sure that we're buying low enough that if we can't disposition the property that we can convert it into a rental or we can actually fix it up and make some repairs and sell it. So we're always experimenting with every property that we that we buy. Does this make sense to 
to wholetail it right away, just put it right back on the market? Does it make sense to just do a little bit of paint and carpet? Can we optimize and get the highest ROI if we just put a little money into it and fix it up? Does it make sense to hold it forever because this is a great neighborhood and it's gonna appreciate and it's in a great school district. So every property that we buy, we make that assessment. But either way, we, we make sure that we're buying low enough that any of those outcomes will work um, over time. And we're not perfect. I would say one out of every 10 properties or 12 properties is a dud. And by a dud, I mean, we break even, we lose three grand. We just, uh, we just sold one earlier and I love to talk about our failures. We just sold one last month and we lost, I brought $20,000 to close. Which one was that? that it was, it was that, that halfway house. Yeah, rid of that? It's gone. Close? It's out of our oh, portfolio. Well, awesome. <laughs> yeah, high five. We did it. So we <laughs> It's bought, good to lose sometimes. We bought- uh, It teaches you what not to keep doing. Yeah, yeah. we bought yeah. this- big multifamily unit that was rented out by the room. So it was not a, it was like a And a weekly rentals. It was weekly oh, yeah. rental for people who are basically partially homeless. You should have, yeah. you should have called Mark on that one. I would have yeah. steered you away from that one. Yeah. I wanted to turn it though to monthly. Well, we had this whole idea. Yeah, it was, there was a lot of things that went wrong with it. But either way, we were out of our expertise and we got burned bad. I mean, we owned the property for about a year and a half and the tenants kind of took over at one point. We had to evict everybody in the entire property, clean it out, and then it sat on the market for another year. So what we um, learned from that one is stay in your lane, work oh, your yeah. avatar that you know. And I think it's okay once in a while to dabble and test stuff out. We bought a few Airbnbs. We've done a few multis that we haven't normally acquired. And we've done really well, too, Some when we've jumped good, out yeah. and done something different. But stay in your lane and know that when you get out of that lane, you're running a, a big risk and be in a position where you can weather that twenty thousand dollar loss for some people, they'd have to file bankruptcy if they lost twenty grand on a house. Well, I, and, and I'm just thinking, like the multis you buy, they're probably like you probably are buying well enough that. Oh, it's insane! Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, exactly. I mean, it's hard to lose on those. Exactly. Yeah. And this one, we wanted to change it and do some stuff, and it ended up not being in the right place, and it just was way too much of a cost if we had wanted to get it to where it needed to be. Well, yeah. t time and effort too, right? It, it's better to lose twenty grand now than to go spend months and months and months. And then in those months and months and months, you lose out on all these other deals because your focus and energy is over here. Right. So we literally have built in what we call the 75% rule when we buy our houses. So we take 75% of the value of the ARV minus the repair cost. And that equals our purchase price. So generally speaking, you know, the repair cost is about 10% of the value of the home. So we're buying it 65%. Yeah. Uh, and one, one of our pivots right now, because of really the uncertainty with COVID and everything, is now we're trying to be at more of a 70-30 mm -hmm. ARV. Yeah, 70% rule. So, I mean, when you subtract the repair costs, we're probably buying at 60%. The last two months have slowed down for us. Actually, in February, we were already dispositioning quite a bit of our inventory. So, we were very fortunate. I would just call it straight luck. We were getting- How many do we of, have right now? We were trying to- Because we we're normally, to do eight acquisitions a month- you know, obviously you have city homes at every yeah. stage. We're, we're yeah. generally all of last year, we were sitting on anywhere from 15 to 20 properties. Time. By the end of February, when all the COVID stuff started, we were down to like eight properties. And then we sold like, well, and we had a strategic meeting yeah. at that point and said, let's disposition yeah. everything and get in a strong cash position. And now we're ready. We have tons of cash and we're ready to go, but we want to kind of wait a little bit longer and see what happens. We are not expecting the big, fallout that I think a lot of people maybe are even experiencing on the coast. Again, the Midwest is very shielded. In 2008, we lost, we were down 7% when other people were dropping 70%. And so with that, we know that all we need to do, if we know the worst is 7%, we'll just buy 7% below, you know, what we were normally buying at and it'll protect. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, you, you guys are buying obviously to wholesale or whole whatever you guys call it to, to put on the market right. without doing much work or you're buying yep. for rental you're buying for cash flow right you're not buying for appreciation i mean the appreciation you're getting is either by doing some repairs and and that's well, we, are, you're not we will say though mark long term on our holds it is strategically our play to find properties that we believe will double in value once the note is paid off now historically they double in value every 10 years so we're actually guessing really low to expect in 20 years it will double in value. But the best way to know what a property, how a property will perform over the next 10 to 20 years is to look at how it performed the last 10 or 20 years. So when we choose to um, buy holds, we're looking at the areas of Omaha that appreciated by at least 100% over the last 20 years. So, so look, basically you're looking for like two and a half percent a year. That's what we want. Yep. And that's average. I mean, that's Omaha's average is 3% a year. So it's yeah. not too crazy to expect that. 
Yeah, and no, you no, probably no. don't have those like like 20% Never. years. Never seen it. So, I mean, you're in a nice steady market. That, that's the easiest place to go make money. Like it, it, it's like, like right. we have some stupid markets here where like it could be 20% up. You're right. in a bidding war with 50 people. Like it's, right. it, it's stupid. Well, so, what we tell people, everyone knows the children's story about the tortoise and the hare. And if you don't know the story, there's a rabbit that's really fast and a turtle that's really slow. And in the end, the turtle wins because it stays consistent the entire time and the rabbit keeps taking naps. The same thing applies to investors. Every investor I've seen that's the hair investor, oh, this is a great deal here and we made a million here. They then lose 1.2 million in five years from now. I would rather be the tortoise and we're young enough to be the tortoise. We can do this for 30 more years and still be young and sitting on a couple hundred units that are paid off. And that's what our, our goal is a thousand doors paid off by the time we're in retirement. Despite the lack of hair, you guys are young, yes. <laughs> when, uh, Bald and beautiful. Oh, geez, don't do that, you're blinding the viewers. <laughs> this is uh, something that Jeff has been very instrumental in uh, is leverage. And we have built a business around this. So we have two full-time acquisition managers that work all of the leads that we generate. We have a marketing director. Uh, my older brother is our project manager on the actual work that we do to get the houses fixed up, whether it's a flip or a rental or even a wholesale. He's managing all of the work that's being done on each house. So I think a lot of people get overwhelmed and think about flipping because they're like, oh, I don't know how to fix up houses. It's like, that's not the point. Fixing up houses. It's not about fixing up houses. It's about not doing it alone, using other people who are talented and staying in your lane, figuring out what you are good at. And we figured out that we can be good at marketing and sales and building that system and then putting the right people in place to help us do everything that we do. I mean, guys, this has been awesome so far. I just wanted some, some quick takeaways that I've had. I mean, you just said it. Be, be, be the tortoise, not the hare, right? Number two is treat this like a business. And number three, I think all of, our, all of the guests I've had on have said this, is this is a numbers game, right? Get out there and talk to everybody. And the more people you talk to, the more deal flow you get, the more investors you get. You know, it, it, I mean, Jeff, Jeff Borum said it when he was on too. He had to talk to 40 banks to get that same deal that you guys got. Yet he got the deal, right? So guys, and, and you know what? At the end of the day, if you're in Ontario, maybe it's investing in the States or maybe, you know, you're in BC, wherever you guys are, there's opportunities everywhere. So it might not be in your backyard. It might be in your backyard. You just might have to make, you know, a hundred thousand phone calls rather than 20,000 phone calls to get a deal yet. It might cost you 10 grand, but you're making a hundred thousand dollars. Right? So exactly. you guys got to look at those types of things. And this is why I want to have different guests on to bring out these types of, you know, that guys like these guys aren't special. Look at them. I mean, we're so average. <laughs> we really are. I mean, they sit on, on, on YouTube channels and eat bacon for God's sake. That's right. It's just doing the consistent boring stuff over long periods of time and you become an expert and you have a huge network. The other last point I'd make, Mark, is that Clint and I do what we say we're going to do and we have our entire lives. So if I tell someone I'm going to close on your house in seven days, and I'm going to pay you $120,000 cash. That's exactly what we do. We had a case where we told a husband and wife, we'd give them 70,000, no less in it independent of if they owe taxes or closing costs. And they got their check for 67,700. You can correct me if I'm wrong. We were off $300 and the wife said to Clint, you promised me we'd be at 70 and I'm at 67.7. And Clint wrote her a check for $300. We do what we say we're gonna do. And when wholesalers have a deal for us, they know if we say we're gonna give you 10 grand, they're gonna get 10 grand. Well, and, and that's why I get deal. That's why I get deal flow because they know if they bring it to me and I say yes, because I usually say yes within 24 hours. Yep. And if I say yes, we're just going to do the deal no matter how, what, right? You go. So do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Do it well. Do it better than anybody else. It's the golden rule, right? Pull it through. Do others as you'd like others to do unto you. So, right. Mark, it was awesome to be on the show today. This was great. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate all the awesome content you're putting out. And we'll keep watching. All right, guys. Well, sh tell everybody where they can find you on uh, – on social media. Yeah, for me, if you want to see, we put out a ton of cool content about different things we're doing. For example, I'm in my virtual reality room right now. I'll actually share my, I've got these H, HTC Vive Pro wireless eight, um, virtual reality goggles. And what we do with these is 
anyone that's building a home, commercial or residential, they can walk the property in six degrees of freedom in our VR room at my house or at my office, which is pretty cool. But we put out a ton of cool tips and tricks like that for investors and residential agents and entrepreneurs. Just follow me on my Instagram page at Jeff M. Cohn, J-E-F-F-M-C-O-H-N. My Instagram is the Clint Bartlett. That's C-L-I-N-T-B-A-R-T-L-E-T-T, the Clint Bartlett. The we'll, Clint Bartlett. We'll, we'll link those in the description below for everybody. Cool. All, all right, guys. Thanks, everybody, again, for watching. You guys made it through. I'm very proud of you. And make sure you like and subscribe. Smash the like button, guys. Have a great one. See you, Mark.